Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. The fields and streets of this land are a battleground. A stroke of a pen, they can destroy a man's life. For a very British conflict. How they could tell it wasn't the right shade of pink is beyond me. That's an abomination, that is. On one side, maverick individuals have broken the rules to create their dream homes. This is an underground aquarium. They're hoping to have a couple of sharks in there. On the other, the planners whose job it is to uphold those rules. The committee don't like being made fools of. Win, and they get to keep their home. All those in favour, please show. Lose, and their dreams will be turned, quite literally, to rubble. The house must be demolished. These determined homeowners are locked in conflict with the planning authorities. A crucial year lies ahead as they face the councils and even court in the final stages of their appeals. I can't focus on anything else. I'm completely obsessed right now. I don't know how to break away from it. In a Lancashire suburb, a seemingly simple redevelopment becomes a nightmare for everyone involved. It's been a complete dog's dinner. Passionate sports fans in Warrington face a battle to save their home from home. I tried to say to them, well, can we save this, can we save that? The delegates for the council were saying, no, we want it down. Fifty Shades of Pink have made one Devon homeowner red with rage. It's been an absolute waste of their time and mine, because it's still pink. And in rural Wales, it's an all-or-nothing battle for a nature-loving idealist who's created a pastoral utopia. I was just driving down this road, and there was a for sale auction sign. I went to go and look at the land, and um, I fell in love with the place. And you can see why. The landscape which tugged at Eddie McIntosh's heartstrings was in Powys, home to some of the most breathtaking scenery in Wales. It was a piece of land that ticked all the boxes. It had water, it had woodland, it had meadow. Which made it the perfect place for the former property developer to set up an ambitious eco-home and business. He bought the 12-acre site in 2008 for £62,000 and renamed it Mellowcroft. My dream was to create a, an off-grid retreat. I didn't know much about off-grid living. In fact, I knew nothing really about it. Undeterred by his glaring lack of experience, Eddie ploughed his savings, a further £200,000, into realising his grand vision for a back-to-basics retreat. He built it all himself, using organic and upcycled materials. The treehouse now is used as a communal kitchen on the ground floor. The first floor is a, a craft shop and a six-person hot tub. This is called the Cedar Shack. This is it. We don't have fancy facilities. That's what an off-grid retreat has to offer. Mellowcroft is pretty much totally reliant on solar and wind energy, and Eddie is even experimenting with new technology he hopes will tap into the energy of the forest. You can get electricity from trees, so in effect, what you can actually do is get trees to talk as well through holding a charge and then through some kind of electronic little voice box, you can get a tree to say hello. Electricity from trees. With that in mind, Eddie planted several Welsh male voice choirs worth, 3,000 in all. He also rebuilt the road and dug irrigation ditches. But his pièce de résistance is his lovingly crafted schoolhouse. It's used for our retreat visitors from yoga, tai chi, photography, cinema night. It took me two years to build this building. A lot of blood, sweat and tears gone into this. For the first four years, Eddie's eco-project was a solitary affair. But then he met nursery teacher Kim. 
In 2012, they were married and now have an 18-month-old daughter, Ellie. Both really fortunate to be here together, bringing up our daughter. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Eddie and Kim's retreat is hugely popular within the community, and they have a 1,000 members from all over the world who pay £10 a year to experience the call of the wild. They can even get married here. It's such a buzz to be able to provide that land for these people. For people like us that have jobs and a mortgage, this gives us an opportunity to come here and be ourselves without the constraints of day-to-day -day life. When you start to put a piece of yourself into land like this, you become connected with it. You know, you, the saying is, you don't own the land, the land owns you. This bit of land allows people to escape from the rat race or whatever you want to call it. When the sun is shining and you look out to the hills, it's, it's breathtaking. With their very own Shangri-La in this picture book pastoral setting, the couple appear to have the perfect life. But there's a problem, because there's one fundamental thing they don't have. I didn't apply for planning permission simply because I, I don't believe it required planning permission. Everything is temporary in nature and everything is, is an organic structure. Unfortunately, Eddie's take on planning law isn't shared by the local authority. And in December 2013, their idyllic eco-existence was shattered. Powys County Council slapped them with an enforcement notice, which threatened to destroy everything they'd worked so hard to build. A complete bolt out the blue, no warning, no letters, just the enforcement notice giving us nine months to take down every structure and return the land to agricultural use. It effectively sought to make us homeless. The council declined to be interviewed for this programme. Their main problem with Eddie's eco-paradise is that the land was originally agricultural, and that means it can be used for farming only. Change of use from agricultural land, it's a change in the legal status of that particular property, and therefore, once you've made that change, it's very hard to reverse it. Nobody wants to see a man and his family evicted from a home that they clearly love, that they have poured their heart and souls into. But by their own admission, they went about it without planning permission, and the planning system is about precedent. And if we let one person get away with it, to be honest, we've got to let others get away with it. And we simply cannot leave our landscape to the mercy of that kind of idea. Eddie felt so confident Mellowcroft was in keeping with the environment, he immediately arranged a meeting with the council to get retrospective planning permission. At the meeting, we were ready to put in a planning application. These people were having none of it. They just flatly refused to accept any planning application. Refusing to be forced off the land, Eddie and Kim appealed against the enforcement order. I intend to fight this enforcement notice with everything that I believe in. Over my dead body, that building would be coming down. It's impossible. I could never let it happen. While Eddie faces his rural nightmare, plans for one dream home in suburbia go horribly awry. Just about everything about this building was wrong. With land today at such a premium, homeowners across Britain are snapping up opportunities to redevelop existing plots in desirable locations. One family man looking for the perfect retirement spot thought he'd found just that in a leafy suburb of Bolton. With its tree-lined streets and green open spaces, the suburb of Lostock is a magnet for the discerning home buyer. Three golf courses, nice shops, several restaurants. It's got a nice place to be. This oasis of tranquility is the setting for a monumental planning battle between local residents, the council, and a single homeowner. What went wrong with 49 Regent Road? I have never known an application uh, or a site that's caused so much problem and has gone on for so long. I've never known it. There's been a complete dog's dinner. It all started when retiring GP, Dr. Mohammed Sidda, bought this bungalow in the area to be near his family, including daughter Nasima. My dad was attracted to Lostock because of its locality 
the fact that it was a quiet and peaceful area. It was somewhere where he wanted to retire in peace, basically. The area may have been perfect, but there was one small thing wrong with the bungalow, its size. Dr Sidder started making big plans to extend it. We're quite a nuclear family. We tend to visit our parents quite a lot and stay over. So when we do get together, it's not just one family at a time. We get the whole family together, and that's why he needed to extend the bungalow to a house. In theory, Dr Sidder's plans seem reasonable and would also be under the watchful eye of the Lostock Residents Association. Neil Atkinson is their spokesman. People pay a lot of money to come and live here. People look after the houses, and people, generally speaking, are uh, looking after each other as well. Quite a bit of community here, too. There's rules and regulations to live in a place like this, and um, probably the council needs to uphold those more than anybody else. Bob Allen is on Bolton Council's planning committee. So within this conurbation of, of Bolton, my particular interest is in Heat and Lossop, this kind of area here. A lot of it is green belt, golf courses and things like that. We have a lot of celebrities uh, and a lot of very big houses. In the wealthier part of, of Lostock in particular, it's a situation where all the houses are demolished, but the replacement is twice the size. So we have a lot of planning issues around large houses on relatively small plots. Dr Sidder's bungalow had the potential to be just such a case. The applicants originally came in to the council and uh, requested permission to extend the bungalow. That was approved. It was in keeping. But the extension idea was soon scrapped in favour of a complete rebuild. And then there was another application to demolish the bungalow and build another house, a different type of house from the one that we'd originally approved. And that was approved, and everything was straightforward from that point. When the new plans came around, we saw a house, two storeys, um, very nice, looked good. Nobody complained, nobody objected. And people were generally very pleased to, to have a doctor to come and live next door to them. My father was really excited, he was really happy, and he just wanted to basically get the house built and move in as soon as possible. In early 2011, building started on Dr Sidder's new, improved home. However, that's when the problem started. Just about everything about this building was wrong. In planning rows, it's not always the biggest projects that grab the headlines. As one homeowner in Devon found, a simple lick of paint can bring the council down on you like a ton of mildly discoloured bricks. The sleepy village of Kenford in Devon is home to many chocolate box cottages. Anne Kennedy owns a pink one. We moved down here around about 2000 and we liked the pink cottage and that was one of the main reasons why we bought the cottage because we'd actually come from another pink cottage which I missed a great deal. Being a bit of a pink house devotee, Anne wanted to keep hers in tip-top condition. And 13 years after moving in, she decided to give it a new coat of paint. It was lovely to see it looking all bright and new again, but I'm afraid my euphoria didn't last very long. It seemed that not everyone in Kemford appreciated Anne's pink abode. The local council felt the shade she'd used was just too, uh, well, pink. Somebody knocked on the door, handed me a letter to say that Timbridge Council said it wasn't the right colour. Thought it was a wind-up, but then realised that, no, it wasn't, and they were absolutely serious. How they could tell it wasn't the right shade of pink is beyond me, because it was still wet. Tainbridge Council's problem was that Anne's rose-tinted retreat is Grade 2 listed, and that means any alterations require special listed building consent. As I understand it, even with a listed building, you don't need planning permission if you're repainting the house. And we were repainting it the same colour. Anne appealed the council's decision, but they were adamant the colour must change. But choosing the right hue proved problematic, even for the professionals. There's lots of pinks in the world today. If you look in a colour chart, I mean, I could bore you with it, with lots of different colours. 
the council came up with a colour which was a lighter colour than the one we'd had on the walls before. Plum cherry or cherry plum, I think. And the council were quite happy with that. But then they chose it, so they should be. The decorating dilemma was solved and the council were finally happy with Anne's cherry plum pink house. I think the council could have handled it better. And it's been an absolute waste of their time and mine for a couple of shades of paint, because that's all that the difference is, because it's still pink. Not all Grade 2 listed buildings are picture postcard cottages. Slap bang in the middle of a car park in Warrington is the King's Head, a pub dating back to the 19th century Victorian era. Four years ago, ex-brewery employee Andy Fannon discovered this neglected gem while taking meter readings ahead of its planned closure and was immediately smitten. It was a very run-down pub in a very run-down area. And I just had a feeling about the pub, so I decided to, to phone the area manager and just take it on. It wasn't the pub's historical heritage that attracted Andy. The King's Head sits a mere stone's throw from the Warrington Wolves Rugby Stadium, which welcomes around 10,000 fans on a weekly basis. We like the King's Head because we've always come here, really, because it's close to the ground. Great atmosphere, brilliant pub, friendly, local people, what more can you ask for? I'll be celebrating here all night because I love this pub. When Andy first took over the pub, it was in desperate need of a makeover. He invested £100,000 and lots of hard graft, convinced he could restore it to its former glory. The potential of the pub I knew because I lived in Warrington was absolutely superb. It, well, it completely refurbished. The bad area was all derelict. The floor was old and decrepit. And it's been three years now to get the pub back to what we'd class as a suitable environment. We've built a community spirit and it is really the Warrington people that have made this place what it is. And his hard work seemed to have paid off. The pub was given a new lease of life and the punters flocked in. But Andy had a new dilemma on his hands. One of the nice problems of the business increasing was that the capacity of the pub became very, very tight. And on our match days, we was really worried about how many people were actually coming into the pub. On certain games, we was actually stopping people coming in because of the safety issue. And that's why we built the conservatory, as the shed as it's become known. And when Andy says shed, he doesn't just mean your average garden shed. He's talking about a 60 by 30 foot, 167 square meter purpose-built fan zone. Once the shed was built, the old atmosphere, the old uh, ethos of the pub began to change. We, we began to get more family orientated. The old pub has really changed from becoming a local man's pub to a local family's pub. Everybody mixes and it's a party atmosphere. Whether Warrington have won, Warrington have lost. The shed was certainly a winner for Andy. But one evening, everything changed when the police turned up to do a routine drugs check and brought a local council officer along too. They came in with the licensing officer. Nothing was found, obviously, because we're very keen on, on that type of it. Unfortunately for Andy, they did find his rather imposing 60-foot shed. Even more unfortunately for Andy, they also discovered that his shiny new conservatory didn't have planning permission which would have been bad enough had the King's Head not been one of Warrington's precious Grade Two listed buildings. A listed building is covered basically from head to toe, inside and out. You'd need listed building consent for just about everything you do to a listed building, short of uh, minor repair. It's councillor Christine Carruthers' job to protect Warrington's heritage against overdevelopment. Among other Grade Two buildings on her watch are nearby parish church, St Elphin's, dating back to the 14th century, and Cromwell's house from the Civil War era. All are subject to strict rules on renovation. Woe betide anyone trying to make alterations without getting the planning authorities on side. Often it's a case of ignorance. They weren't aware. How unfortunately, in terms of unauthorised works to list a building, uh, ignorance isn't a defence. I didn't realise 
that you needed plan permission for the conservator. Uh, I based it upon domestic properties, um, which I was told unwisely that you didn't need planning permission. After Andy's shed was spotted, Christine's department sent in a team of planning officers to assess the site. Within a five minute walkabout of the whole building, uh, one of the delegates actually said, we want that building down. I tried to say to him, well, can we save this? Can we save that? Can we use this? Look at the financial investment we've done. I understand they've done wrong. I'll, I'll take the penalty for that. The delegates for the council were saying, no, we want it down. In July 2014, the council sent Andy an enforcement notice demanding the total demolition of the shed within two months. With a pub's future hanging in the balance, in Powers, Wales, Eddie's story is about to take a devastating turn. I don't know if we split up as a family. I don't know. Strict British planning rules have ensured only 10% of land here has been developed. Even the remotest parts of the countryside are fiercely protected, as Eddie McIntosh found out when he built an off-grid eco-retreat in rural Wales. It's now six months since the bombshell came from Powers County Council, saying the property didn't have planning permission and must therefore be demolished. Desperate to save their dream, Eddie and Kim have appealed the decision. But rather than hire a barrister, they've made the brave and highly risky decision to represent themselves at a public inquiry scheduled for the autumn. Uh, representing ourselves seems to be the, the, the best way forward to get our case across. In a, in a fair and honest way. But the time and effort Eddie and Kim have spent preparing for their showdown while trying to run the retreat is starting to take its toll. Other things have suffered, um, but, well, the, the project suffered as a Jesus. result. You know, it's taken over our lives, hasn't it, totally, this year? Totally consumed. Missing out on time Evidence. with my family, with my daughter, you know, I'm yeah. sitting up till four or five o'clock in the morning, trying to type up on the computer, get all the language right. Six weeks before the public inquiry is due to begin, Eddie and Kim get some unexpected news. The council have decided to hold a closed meeting to decide the fate of, of our enforcement notice. Eddie is deeply frustrated at being excluded from the meeting, but ever ready with his alternative take on things, he decides to email the councillors a song to express his feelings. So, yeah, I sent them Labry Sifri, there's something inside so strong. No matter cause there's something inside so strong, so strong. I know that I can make it. This is a great confidence booster. Mind up here. It's all mind. It's all it is. I know we're on the right path. Really? They'd have to burn me out of here to get me out of this place. There's no way I would leave. But following the meeting, Eddie's inquiry is postponed and the enforcement notice withdrawn so it can be amended for resubmission. I can only guess that this is because they feel that they're beat on the original enforcement notice and that by reserving a second reinforcement notice, it might help their cause. Eddie is now in limbo until the rescheduled inquiry. It's a bit like waiting for the school bully to, to beat you up at the end of the school day. You know it's coming, you know what's going to happen. You've just got to wait for it. Eddie is pushing the council to get on with it, and a month later, there's finally some movement. Today, we're expecting a visit by the local authority, the planning department. Hopefully, we'll be able to clear up when we're going to be served the enforcement notice. The council officers do not want to appear on camera. As Eddie's frustrations grow, the exchanges become heated. The meeting ends badly, with the officers refusing to continue and walking off site. Today didn't really go that well. Now we just have to wait for the next enforcement notice, and one can only presume they'll do the same as what they done last year. They'll serve it just before Christmas. Eddie believes there's a weak spot in one of the council's key arguments, that the main entrance to Mellowcroft is unsafe. The highway report was compiled after the enforcement notice was originally served on us. 
the motivation can only be to fail our highway, to back up the enforcement notice. But Eddie has managed to get a second opinion from a retired senior highways officer who disputes the findings. The report that we got from this gentleman showed our highway to, to not be um, unsafe. His plan of attacks coming together, but Eddie can't present any of his evidence until the council make their move and an inquiry date is set. In the meantime, the stress of the situation has had a devastating effect on his family life. It's five weeks ago now that Kim left. I can't even blame Kim. I'd be anxious. We just had a baby. What school is she going to go to? What's our future? I don't know if we've split up as a family. I don't know. I, still, I can't focus on anything else still. You know, I, I still have to think about the enforcement notice. Our arguments have been like, well, let's just get away. I'm sorry, but I can't. I'm, I'm completely obsessed right now. I don't know how to break away from it. In the past five years, one in ten homeowners has broken planning rules. And as one man in Lancashire discovered, sometimes all it takes is a breakdown in communication for something to go catastrophically wrong. Dr. Mohammed Siddha's grand plan was to knock down this bungalow and build a five-bedroom home. Every detail was scrutinised, not just by council planners, but by eagle-eyed neighbours. The plot was empty. Um, the bungalow that was there was already degenerating. We didn't see a problem with somebody extending the house upwards. We didn't see a problem with a new roof on it. Um, and nobody seemed to be have any real problems with it at all. This was my dad's first build, and he'd never built any property from scratch. So he had no um, experience in this. Unfortunately, at the time when the building started, uh, that's when he had a serious health condition and he wasn't able to fully give his time to the house and I think that's where things started going wrong. With the lines of communication on the project blurred, neighbours began to notice the house was starting to look bigger than the plans that the council had approved. It got to be about the top of the ground floor. People said how big it looked. building continued until you see this building now. I think that's a six-bedroom house next door to it, Well, this one is so much bigger, you could put the other one inside it. People were talking about it in the realms of it's a church. I always thought about it as a, a tire-fitting garage with the two bays at the front. A real eyesore within Regent Road. The locals put in numerous complaints, but by now the house was nearly finished and Dr. Siddha was in India in long-term recuperation after an operation. He'd had the whole house built, the roof was just ready to go on. Prior to that, nobody had told him that things were not right, so he was unaware of that. Council officers made regular checks that the building regulations were being adhered to, but the size of the build wasn't part of their remit. During the 10-month period when this building uh, was put together, um, one of Bolton Council's building control engineers made 11 visits to this site and didn't realise that it was the wrong size. I actually asked the planning control people why they didn't measure it and they said it wasn't their job to measure it. I asked somebody within uh, the case officer within planning why he didn't measure it and he said it wasn't his job either. We simply don't have the resources to go out and keep measuring sites to make sure it's being built as it should have been built. The neighbours eventually took matters into their own hands. Residents measured the building and it turned out that it was something like three and a half metres too deep, two metres too wide and a metre and a half too high. It was calculated that the building was 55% bigger than it was supposed to be. Residents informed the council who finally realised something was very wrong. The committee don't like being made fools of. So the enforcement notice was served by the council to stop the building. To be told that he can't go ahead with the build um, was absolutely devastating. Um, 
it had a financial impact on my father as well as the stress. In a belated bid to straighten the mess out, the Sidders now applied for retrospective permission on the outsized build. The planning authority said, no, it's not an acceptable uh, alternative application to what we gave you permission for. It's way too big. They appealed in this case, the inspectorate turned down the appeal. The only step after that then is the enforcement action which says the house must be demolished, the house must be removed. Having spent three years and £100,000 renovating the Grade 2 listed King's Head pub in Warrington, landlord Andy is fighting to save it from demolition. The battle is over Andy's new 60-foot extension, affectionately called the Shed by the regulars, who weren't about to let a paltry matter like planning regulations get in the way of their enjoyment. Uh, we love the extension, the extension. The back. What Andy's done to the place is brilliant. A petition was started and now numbers 1,600 signatures. We've had people saying they're going to chain themselves to the roof if the council make it take it down. With militancy in the air and people willing to throw themselves in front of the demolition ball, the council are feeling the pressure. We are acutely aware of the public demand with that location, you know, and we're very keen to work with uh, Mr Fannon to ensure that uh, any development is done in accordance with the listed status of the building. We're not anti-pub, we're very keen to support them. Any development has to be done in the right way. Hi, mate. Good to see you again. There we go. 1,600 on the paper, 1,600 on the paper, on the, paper in the end, yeah. Oh, right. And nearly 400 on the online right. and stuff. Oh, right. Touching 2,000 so, people. Oh, right. So it really is a great boost. See you later. <laughs> Don't blame you. Andy hopes this petition will help win over the planners. He wants another 12 months to come up with a new plan for the shed. A special meeting has been called by the council planning committee. Item one first, which is the King's Head, 40 Winnet Street, Warrington, proposed erection of a conservatory, and this is a retrospective application for a temporary 12 month which was sought. It's been seven months since the council first ordered the shed to be removed, and time is not on Andy's side, as the councillors quiz him about his lack of progress. The enforcement notice was served in June last year, um, there have now been seven months since that enforcement notice was served and we haven't seen any um, detailed suggested alternatives before us. Would you like to tell us why it, nothing's been done so far? Would you like to, to put your side of it? Yes, I would. Um, for an independent landlord to follow that process of enforcement is, is beyond my capability. So within that time, I had to get people to... to Relate to me, let me understand what the enforcement meant, what, the, what, uh, what, what they could do. So we had to defend that. So that took me eye off the ball. Unfortunately, we've had to find another structural sort of architect, what of the card, to come up with some other plans. The committee seem unimpressed by Andy's explanations. When you acquired the premises, were you aware that this was a listed building? No. Your solicitor did not advise you? I, I didn't have a solicitor. I mean, for me, that, that, that's, a very, that's a very serious issue because, for me, the situation would have been different if the, you had known it's a listed building and you willfully mm. took steps exactly. that are not appropriate to, to a listed building. Ignorance is no excuse. No, I, I it, is, it is a listed building and you have ended up, through no fault of your own, taking a whole series of steps, both with the interior what? and with the shed, which don't apply to the building. And my concern is that... If we were to be accommodating with the request you're making today, that simply provides an incentive for anybody else who's got a listed building but doesn't want to do the necessary things to maintain its heritage to do what they like. It's Andy's last chance to fight his case and save the conservatory and the pub. King's Ed, it's a superb building, it's got superb heritage, it's a local community building, but it needs to be viable, it needs to be financed. We've always said we will put in whatever we need to put up to satisfy. The problem that we've got, as you know, with 29 pubs a week closing, if the, if the conservatory doesn't carry on, the pub is not viable um, and people will lose their jobs. Clearly, as has been said, and by the number of people who are here, 
this is a very well loved and well used pub and a great asset in that sense to the community. We seem to be stuck putting the devil in the deep blue sea that uh, if we don't have a viable use for such buildings, they will fall into disrepair. On the other hand, uh, if the only way of using them is to destroy the, the heritage aspect of it, then the heritage is going to go anyway. Now, I feel that the success of the pub will help towards uh, maintaining the pub uh, and the look of it and, and the heritage of it, I would imagine, because uh, if, if that shuts, it will be derelict and... Um, won't be worth, won't be worth uh, looking after, really. Has Andy done enough to convince the committee 12 months is all he needs to come up with a proposal that meets their approval and saves his business? I appreciate the, the, the good work in bringing the pub back from the brink, and obviously we're all concerned about the viability of the place. However, um, a year extension to me seems maybe a little bit excessive. Um, for the planning permission. The only thing I can say to you is everything that I've done in the pub has been for the benefit of the pub and I've invested a lot of money into that site and I don't intend for it to fail for the one of a few months. Um, so if we could amend it to a nine months, I I'd be a lot happier with that. After a gruelling two-hour session, the councillors deliberate their decision. Andy has support from two of the committee, but will the others back the nine-month extension? I should put it to the vote. Those in favour approving that amended application to nine-month, please show. Anyone against? The application is approved under the new conditions. Thank you. Thank you. That's it now, back to the pub, yeah. yeah. Let's have a pint. Yeah. Cheers, mate. Thanks for coming. Nine months you've got some work. Now. Andy will need to get his skates on. It's not the 12 month reprieve he'd hoped for, but nine months should be enough time to put in motion an acceptable new plan for the conservatory. I feel relieved at this moment in time. It's a weight off my shoulders. We will get to what, what we want, as what they want as well, I suppose. Um, no, it's a great feeling tonight, it's a great feeling. Yeah. The 150-year-old King's Head will live to see another day. Oh, that, that's sweet, that. That's but as Andy and his regulars celebrate, events in Lostock are about to reach a drastic conclusion. One of the most common problems in British planning disputes is overbuilding on modest plots. In a leafy Bolton suburb, one textbook case has become infamous. Dr Mohammed Siddha had plans approved for a spacious family home to replace the existing bungalow, but when the new build grew way beyond what was permitted, Bolton Council stepped in and ordered its demolition. After the demolition order was put in, my father was absolutely devastated. But Dr Sidda refused to give up. He was determined to come up with a plan that would allow him to keep at least some of his oversized home. He'd wanted to save as much of the building as possible, so he'd left it to the architect and the builders to put in an application in order to do that. Over a two-year period, they put in a total of five planning applications, trying to find a compromise with the council over the permitted size of the building. Most people put in a planning application and it gets rejected and they go away and make the plans correct. It just seems crazy that you can just keep applying for more and more applications. Um, it doesn't seem to matter whether it's good, bad or indifferent. The paperwork has spawned 369 different documents. It's frustrating for the council and the committee when applications keep coming in again and again and again. But the council are obliged to deal with every application. In September 2014, after years of stalemate, the Sidder family realised there's only one option left if they are to avert the threat of criminal prosecution for non-compliance. They call in a specialist demolition company 
to raise Dr. Sidder's dream home to the ground. I think my dad was let down, and I think, unfortunately, that was the cause for the, um, the demolition of the house. Not everyone is sorry to see the building go. This is the culmination of four years, and to see it demolished today is absolutely fantastic. A remarkable 12 planning applications later, and with total cost to all involved running to hundreds of thousands of pounds, the now infamous site lies empty, leaving all parties pointing the finger about how a seemingly simple build unraveled so disastrously. Who is the fault? The fault is with the owner and the fault is with the council. I think my father was naive, but the council didn't stand up and say, OK, fine, we've not been helping you out here, we've not told you what needs doing. It was all about saying, this is your fault. An applicant says to us, well, it wasn't my fault, it was the builder that did it. Then the applicant takes that up with the builder. We deal only with the applicant because they're the person who is legally responsible. But Dr Sidder has no intention of leaving this site empty. Five years after this project began, the family have submitted their 13th and hopefully final planning application for a scaled-down four-bedroomed house. All those in favour, please show. Any against, application is approved. I'm personally glad that it's, um, it's been dealt with now and I hope it will not come back again. I hope that this is the end of it. After all that's happened, it's clear any future developments will be closely watched. To say we're disappointed, I think, is the, is the fairest way of putting it. But I'm sure that uh, there'll be a hundred set of eyes on 49 Regent Road. It's been a full year since Eddie McIntosh was served with the original enforcement notice to demolish his Mellowcroft retreat. With his wife and daughter gone, Eddie will stop at nothing in what has become an intensely personal battle with the council's planning department. Really, out of sheer desperation, I, I decided to start contacting the head of Powers County Council. Today, I'm going to be having a meeting with the um, chief executive, and um, I'm going to be showing him the evidence that I have. Ever optimistic Eddie is feeling confident. I'm excited. I'm um, I feel in such a good power position. That's nice. Powers Council are unwilling to be filmed. The meeting with the senior council staff lasts well over an hour. Yes, yeah, so I've just come out of the meeting with the chief executive. It was a really positive, progressive meeting. He's a level-headed, calm guy. He seemed to get the situation quickly, and I'm very confident that the enforcement notice is not arriving anymore. Powers Council have declined to be interviewed for this programme, but in a statement they said, the council is currently reviewing all its options regarding this matter and cannot comment on the application until all proceedings have ended. But Ed is reading these latest exchanges as promising. Since the meeting with the chief executive, we've been invited to submit a planning application. We seem to be kind of moving forward and, uh, you know, we're, we're confident that we can work with the local authority. Based on his reading of the situation, Eddie is now drafting a retrospective application to get revised permission for the existing structures on the land. And is even working on getting consent to build a family home. So the house that's going to be built here is um, built over two storeys, two floors. The, the ground floor being of earthship construction, which is primarily car tyres rammed with earth, and then earth banked up around the outsides of that with um, a Swiss mountain lodge put on the top. 
And there's other good news. Well, as you know, you know, Kim and Ellie left just before Christmas. They're back now. It's a beautiful thing, and it's what I put my heart and soul into. I'm back on a mission of building our life here. Next time, a planning dispute which has led to a 30-year court battle. They're trying to wear me down. Won't happen. Won't happen. An ill-fated eco-build leaves its owner with an agonising dilemma. I was damned if I did and I was damned if I didn't. And a log cabin that the council are desperate to cut down to size. It's like a big game of chess. Each time I'm getting closer to be putting in checkmate. Thank you.